Welcome to the program. I'm Jeff Sheckman. One day last week, if you picked up the New York Times, you would have discovered that more than half the stories on the front page were directly related to science. Think about what we're dealing with. Public health information, cutting edge vaccines, climate change, fires, hurricanes, technology for good and for ill, privacy, transportation, artificial intelligence, medicine, and the frontiers of space and of our oceans. The future of science is the future of mankind. And as a result, science journalism itself has perhaps more than ever come into its own. Leading that effort is Scientific America. It's been the gold standard for understanding science. It is the oldest continuously published monthly magazine in the United States. And recently, for the first time in its 175-year history, it's dipped its toe into political waters, making a presidential endorsement. Perhaps it was inevitable, given today's reality, that science and politics would somehow become conflated. We're going to talk about all of this today with my guest, the editor-in-chief of Scientific America, Laura Helmuth. Laura has degrees in science writing and received her Ph.D. in cognitive neuroscience from the University of California, Berkeley. And it is my pleasure to welcome Laura Helmuth here to the program. Laura, thanks so much for joining us. Hey, thanks so much for having me. It's great to have you here. A lot has been made of the focus of Scientific America for the first time in 175 years, making a political endorsement. And certainly a lot of it has to do with the attitudes of the current administration. And we'll talk a bit about that. But to what extent does it also have to do with the way in which science has become such a large part of almost every aspect of our lives today? I think that's right. And I think, you know, in in past campaigns and even in this one, science tends to not be a big campaign issue. uh, And we think it should be. You know, science, especially, you know, when, when we talk about science, we think about it broadly. You know, science encompasses you know, public health and, and medicine and the environment and technology. I mean, these are the most important things um, that determine the quality of life and, and the future of civilization. And we should be talking about it and politicians should be talking about it. And they should be quite clear about what their um, their beliefs are and their plans and uh, whether they'll accept the science and look at evidence uh, to make smart policy. To what extent has this focus on science and the way it has, has woven itself, as you say, into every aspect of our lives, how has that changed the way Scientific America covers science and, and the way the magazine has evolved over the past several years? Yeah, we've had, it, it's interesting, we just had our 175th anniversary, and so we used that occasion to look back at some of our history, and we have been pretty outspoken about political and social Uh, subjects for a long time. So in the 1940s and 50s, the editors were very um, skeptical and very uh, critical of the arms race. And in fact, in 1950, we uh, we upset some of the Atomic Energy Commission's censors so much that they burned 3,000 copies of our magazine. Uh, yeah, they claimed it was a you know, threat to national security uh, because it had an article that was critical of the hydrogen bomb by physicist Hans Bethe. Uh, that, that issue also, incidentally, had an article by, um, by Albert Einstein. And so they insisted that we revise the article, and we made some trivial changes, but some of them had already been published. So they went in and actually burned the thing, the magazines that had been um, already off the printers. We were critical of the Star Wars missile defense. We're very critical of intelligent design, um, very supportive of embryonic stem cell research. So we've, we've weighed in before, but it's, you know, it's, it's, science has become increasingly politicized, and it's, it's never been so politicized as it is now. The people that write for the magazine and the people that cover science and those that are engaged in it, to what extent are they impacted by the way in which science has become so politicized? Yeah, I think we're seeing it. The the most visible way we're seeing that is all the just public health, you know, the the public servants who work on public health, um, the, the public health advisors for cities and states are getting death threats. Uh, and all kinds of harassment because they're just sharing like basic epidemiology around the coronavirus pandemic and people who you know, claim it's a hoax or claim that, you know, it, it's something that's just out you know, that the Democrats are doing to get Trump, you know, that, that we made up this whole disease. Um, they're they're really uh, just being terrible and, and they're dangerous and uh, and threatening just people who are doing epidemiology and contact tracing and uh, and basic medical research and communication. 
Is there a greater responsibility, do you think, for science coverage today, given the impact it has on people's lives, the direct impact that it has? Yeah, I think you know, it's never been more important to have really clear evidence-based um, reporting, especially about the pandemic, but also, of course, about climate change, about systemic racism, um, you know, all the important issues have kind of an evidence-based, data-rich research component. And, um, you know, what we do as science writers is to help people understand how the world works. And sometimes that's black holes. And sometimes that's, you know, why is the coronavirus disproportionately killing people of color? And um, it's, it's really important to help everybody understand, uh, you know, what our biggest challenges are and the biggest dangers and how they can, you know, protect themselves from the, from the pandemic and, and make good decisions to protect ourselves from current and future climate change problems. Talk about climate change and how the coverage of it has, has grown and, and obviously will continue to grow. Yeah. One of the things, you know, we, when, you, when we're thinking about journalism and what are some of the things journalists could be doing better, one of the kind of problems with traditional, especially political journalism, is there's this idea that you have to tell both sides of every story. And sometimes, absolutely, you should, you should represent both sides and show kind of the best argument on two sides of a legitimate policy debate. But I think science journalists discovered, you know, in the past couple decades, 10, 20 years ago, that um, showing both sides of some issues is actually – not helping readers. It's, it's misleading readers if you act like both sides are legitimate. And certainly, you know, with evolution, like we wouldn't quote a creationist in a story about evolution. And likewise, you know, we, for a while, um, reporters were quoting climate science skeptics in stories about climate change. But the evidence is just so overwhelming that climate change is real. It's happening. It's catastrophic, and we need to take it seriously. Um, and so that's that's kind of the focus of the coverage now is is the debate. You know, there are certainly debates about what are the best ways to mitigate it or adapt or um, you know change our energy systems to to reduce it. Uh, but there's we no longer science journalists no longer uh, quote climate skeptics when we're talking about the reality of climate change. Is that true, do you think, across the board today? And how different is it covering science as, as Scientific America versus the way you were looking at it when you were doing this for the Washington Post? Yeah, for, for I mean, the, the, one of the nice things about being at Scientific American is we can say what we know a little bit more clearly. Um, the you know, reporters at some of the legacy newspapers at the Post and the Times still a little bit are pressured to do both sides. Um, journalism. And, uh, you know, I think the, the science team, science and health team at the Post are, are really good about saying what's real. And with vaccines, for instance, really good about uh, explaining how the anti-vaccine movement works without giving any credence to the idea that, that the vaccine, anti-vaccine movement has any basis in reality. Um, so, yes, I mean, I think we can, we can be a little bit more outspoken at Scientific American, and that's partly because we publish um, news stories and feature stories, but we also publish a lot of opinion and analysis pieces where we can just be really straight about uh, this, is, this is what we know and this is what it means. As science has become more central, what have you seen in terms of changes of, of the readership of Scientific America? Yeah, we've gotten, uh, this has been, you know, for terrible reasons, it's been a, a, a year of high traffic. Um, people are really reading a lot about the um, coronavirus pandemic, um, we, you know, a lot about um, systemic racism and the Black Lives Matter movement um, and, and climate change, too. I mean, I think people, especially during the summer when it's really hot and there's hurricanes and forest fires or wildfires, um, there's, I think there's increasing awareness and interest in scientific subjects. And then, you know, sometimes it's just delightful things like, hey, maybe there's life on Venus. You know, here's this weird gas that they'll think is produced by microbes and we found it in the atmosphere of Venus and maybe maybe it's life. We, you know, that's that's a big question. So there's a lot of interest. And I also think during the pandemic, it sort of increased people's understanding of, of how science works and just their capacity to to understand and to learn more about science. Um, I mean, you think back at the beginning of the year, hardly anybody knew what, you know, asymptomatic transmission meant or cytokine storms or, um, you know, all the, or aerosol transmission, um, you know, all these terms that we've all 
learned um, since the pandemic has gone around the world. And, um, and, and so I think people are just like kind of more aware of science in their lives this year than they have been in the past. And how frustrating is it, and this brings us back to the political equation, how frustrating is it when you hear from the White House that, you know, quote unquote, scientists don't really know what's going on? Yeah, I know. It's, it's, it's just so bad. He's just so, I mean, he's so wrong. And it's not even that he, you know, there's a fact that he's missing. It's he's willfully misrepresenting, you know, the, the, this huge body of scientific knowledge. Um, yeah, scientists know what's going on. They know that the impact that climate change is having on droughts, on um, susceptibility to wildfires. I mean, there are a lot of factors. Like, there's no one single thing that causes a wildfire. Um, but, you know, when it, when it comes to climate change, there's there's extensive knowledge and, and, you know, we have very good predictions and, you know, it looks like uh, 2020 is, is on track to, it could well be the hottest year on record. It's, it's already going to be in the top five. Um, so, and, you know, it's, it's still September and we can say that with, with good certainty uh, that this, you know, this, this far out from the end of the year. Um, so yeah, it's, it, science just knows a lot. And, and the politicians who claim that, oh, we just don't know enough, um, you know, there's too much uncertainty. I mean, they're they're very much like the the, the politicized agents in you know the 50s, 60s, and 70s who said, oh, we don't know that smoking causes cancer. Some people smoke and don't get cancer. Um, so it's that sort of you know, just dishonest um, discourse that that we that just drives us nuts at Scientific American. And in this larger context, is this endorsement perhaps? the beginning of, of the magazine and science in general becoming more political in order to make its case? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I think I think science and scientists have become a lot more engaged, uh, especially during the Trump administration. I mean, thinking back to the March for Science, when we had, you know, perhaps a million people around the world marching for science and, you know, carrying funny signs and, and dressing up and, and just massing. Um, in D.C., in New York, all around the world. I think there was a group in Antarctica. And, you know, in the past, you wouldn't think science is something you have to march for. It just seems like, well, yeah, duh. I mean, science is important and not everybody enjoys it or does it, but it's generally a good thing. And so I think there's a, a sense that, you know, with science feeling under threat, that it's more important than ever for scientists to you know, write about their own expertise, um, cooperate with journalists who are covering their fields, um, you know, get out there, talk to student groups, talk to community groups, and um, and make it you know, clear how science works and why it's important and kind of refuse to allow the misrepresentations to stand unchallenged. Beyond the misrepresentations, the other overlay to all of this is this kind of rejection of expertise. Talk about that. Yeah, that's another thing. I mean, uh, it's and, and this is something we've seen you know, from Trump throughout you know, his candidacy, uh, throughout you know throughout his public career, and, and certainly during the administration. You know, if you look back to, to to the Obama administration, of course, you know that that was the, the, the people who were appointed to important posts and allowed to do their jobs right. You know, actually understood the fields they were overseeing. They understood energy. They understood the oceans. Uh, at you know at the national um, you know all, all the national labs had good leaders. So. And now, um, you know, we have an administration where many of the people appointed to, to science positions, um, you know, have a, a history of kind of rejecting the uh, the agencies they're working for or wanting to shut down the agencies they're working for. Um, so that, yeah, that's a problem with the, the people he's chosen who, who are very much not experts. Uh, but then, you know, to have all these experts available um, and, you know, there to advise on how to make good policy and just to reject every evidence, every bit of evidence, um, if it's inconvenient. Uh, that's just been a, a really strong pattern, and it's really dangerous. Is there a sense that, that, regardless of who's president, that the government needs to do more or pay more attention to science in general and, and incorporate it more in policy in many, many areas? Yeah, I think that's absolutely true. And and one of the things, you know, if, if Biden is elected, um, yeah, I hope one of the things he does really quickly is restore um, expert advisory panels. And these are just groups of scientists who aren't employed by the federal government but have expertise that's relevant to, say, you know, invasive species. And um, they volunteered their time to to uh, advise on 
you know, how the Department of Agriculture can prepare for invasions and respond to them. And the Trump administration basically eliminated most of these panels or replaced the scientists with people from industry. Um, so there's just so much, you know, scientific expertise in this country, so many people who know what they're talking about and, and would feel a duty to kind of help the government at all levels make good decisions or, you know, at least informed decisions. Um, and, and I think that's quite doable. From the point of view of, of Scientific America, talk a little bit about the nexus between science in, in this broad sense that we've been talking about it and technology, which which gets covered so much and that people pay so much attention to. And certainly it's, it's a part of science, but sometimes it seems to overwhelm the reality of science. Yeah, it does. Yeah, that's right. I mean, gadgets, um, you know, I'm talking to you about a gadget, You've got a house full of gadgets and uh and they're cool and they're fun and, you know, the holidays are approaching and people like to buy them for each other. Um, so, yeah, it's kind of hard to compete. And it's and I think, you know, as they get more user friendly, too, and, and you don't have to be such an expert to use them or, you know, it, it, which is how it should be. I mean, they should be easy to use. But that sort of obscures the um, all the research that went into into these things. You know, every every single, you know, chip and wire and, and program uh, is is standing on the shoulders of giants of, of you know, decades and decades of research on technology, um, or research of basic research that then gets applied into technology, and uh, and I, I just I hope and, and we need to find better ways to kind of help people understand that all the things that make life better, you know, that make make it easier to communicate with people, to make your house comfortable more efficiently, um, you know, all the all the things that make modern life so convenient are thanks to you know massive investments in science. Talk a little bit about your own journey from doing research into cognitive neuroscience to becoming editor in chief of Scientific America. Yeah, it was. Uh, yeah, I went to grad school at, at UC Berkeley, um, which was a blast. I, I really loved graduate school and loved doing science. Um, but I, uh, I I took a, a break one summer and wrote for a travel guide for a summer and realized kind of had this epiphany that oh, writing is fun too, and I could actually write about science. Um, so I went to a, a science writing program at UC Santa Cruz, a science communication program that trains people with some science background to be um, science writers, uh, which includes you know, science videographers, science uh, radio reporters, uh, science communicators who work for uh, companies or for universities. And so that's how I made the transition. And uh, But they're, they're very compatible. I mean, if you think about it, scientists, um, you know, they get data and journalists do reporting. And in both cases, you're kind of interrogating the world and trying to understand it and make a comprehensive story about how the world works. Are you surprised at the response that that you've gotten with Scientific America making this first political endorsement in 175 years? Yes, we were, we were, yeah, we weren't sure if anybody would pay attention. And we were a little worried that we'd just be overwhelmed with, uh, you know, trolls and and people complaining about it. And, and there's certainly been some people who had, had legitimate concerns. Are, you know, are we contributing to the politicization of science? And, and we worry about that, too. But overwhelmingly, the response has been very positive. And, uh, and people seem grateful to, you know, for, the, for the, you know, the, just the very straight science-based um, justification for why one candidate is much better for the future of the United States and the whole world than the other. To what extent is is Scientific America look taking a much more global perspective today than maybe it did 20, 30 years ago? Yeah, we do. We're trying to do that. And in fact, we're part of a we have a network of publications, of, of partner publications um, that you know, translate some of our stories or in some cases they have original stories. And we translate them for Scientific American. So we have a Spectrum der Wissenschaft in German, and we have a French version, a Spanish version, Italian. Um, there's a, we're working on hopefully going to get a Korean edition, um, and we have a, an Arabic edition. So we're, tr we're um, and the editors in chief of all these magazines, we meet regularly to talk about our coverage and talk about working together to, to bring a more global perspective because science is the, you know, the most international endeavor in, in all of human history. There's never been anything where so many people work with, other, with people from other countries on common goals. Finally, talk a little bit about what we all should be looking at. Where should our focus be in terms of science? right now? What's what's the most important thing that you think that, that you're covering right now? 
Oh, that's a good question. Yeah, there's there's so much. And it, it's a little overwhelming. It, and we, we noticed it, you know, during the pandemic shutdown, sports stopped and new movies stopped being released and you know, new play, play Broadway shut down. So kind of the other things people pay attention to didn't weren't happening anymore, but science kept going. Um, and there's just new stuff every day. There's some new, you know, understanding of the world from science. Um, so I think, you know, it, it's all interesting, but the, the fields that are really kind of most important, I think, for the immediate future, obviously, are climate science, um, earth, earth science, uh, kind of understanding natural disasters. Uh, and then, you know, astronomy is, is having a great, uh, you know, a great run. Um, the, the, you know, it seems like every year there's some exciting astronomy story, uh, but also, you know, social science um, and it is just, this is an amazing time for social science. Uh, we have a package coming up on the science of misinformation, uh, which, you know, of course, has repercussions or, you know, has has been inspired by political things. Um, but, you know, a whole lot of social science and behavioral science and, and um, science on mental health uh, coming out of the pandemic as, you know, people's sleep cycles are changing. There's much more depression and anxiety, um, much better understanding of kind of the role of social interactions uh, in our daily lives. So we think that a lot of behavioral science will be really, uh, really important to, to, to take away from this pandemic. Laura Helmuth, the editor-in-chief of Scientific America. Laura, I thank you so much for spending time with us. Thank you so much. Thank you.